Welcome to His House of Learning, podcast number six. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. Compassion, caring for our sons and sheep. Today's topic is going to be in relation to my previous talk, the other series, in this case particularly Members of Mystery Babylon, part six. <laughs> In conjunction, did not plan that exactly, as far as the numbers go. Mystery, members of Mystery Babylon Part 6, Buddhism. Also known in the West, in uh, less quote-unquote spiritual forms, but still nonetheless spiritual in nature, mindfulness. Because there's uh, quite a few notions of the term compassion floating around in the world. And whether it be in that of the church at large, or in the East, it seems that it is going the wrong direction, and our focus lies not in the heart of the Lord God, but in the emotions, the affections of men. And I say that because it seems like when it comes to compassion, the general term is just regards to a sense of sorrow, it's service based on sadness and sorrow, which initiates the desire to provide. And at base, that may be so, but when you look further into the nature of compassion, especially of what's communicated in Scripture, particularly by the Lord God himself, and even as he teaches man to do so, and there's a few instances of which we'll look into as well, where you have those who are not of the Lord God who express compassion. Even then it seems that our modern, more abstract, if not impersonal application, even falls short of a pagan within the narrative scripture. Where you see, compassion is more than just the feeling to help, and really acting on that help. To be fair, to those who use compassion, it's not just, it's not just the emotion, but also the action following. But the question is, from what state of mind and heart are you, and to whom is extended? Or it seems rather, oftentimes in this world, broad. And there is that, <laughs> there is that a uh, fairly old modern saying. You know, the you know hell is you know the way paved to hell is on that of good intentions. But if those intentions aren't based on the word. Well, then, it's unfortunately things fall short and things get uh, well rather more disrupted than restored. When it comes to the Lord God, it seems. To be that there's been the incursion of an extra biblical phrase, and that is unconditional love. And I'm not here to debate the phrase, but indeed, when you apply love in general to that phrase, well, then you start to miss some pretty significant points. In this case, in the nature of compassion itself. Or it seems like there are conditions of the heart of those giving the compassion and those receiving it. You'll see what I mean shortly. Let's turn our attentions over to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13. Looking at verses 12 through 18. And it says, If thou shalt hear say in one of the cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire, and make search, and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain, that such abomination is wrought among you. Thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of, the, of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. And thou shalt gather all the spoil 
of it to the midst of the street thereof and shall burn with fire the city and all the spoil thereof every whit for the lord thy god it shall be and heap forever and shall not be built again and there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand that the lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show thee mercy and have compassion upon thee and multiply thee as he hath sworn unto thy fathers when thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments which I have commanded thee this day to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. So here you have a sense of compassion is, this is why the title says compassion is care for sons and sheep. In this case here's the Lord making it clear that to be vigilant that you keep abomination, that you keep idolatry, that you keep just evil at its finest out of your land, out of your homes. And thus, he will have what mercy and have compassion upon thee and multiply thee as he has sworn to thy fathers. So mind you, this is this was the law given back to Israel. But as you're going to see later, it's also in relation to that of one's own individual heart as well. The Lord may have compassion on us when we when we actively, as you know, as stated in the in the wisdom literature, particularly in Proverbs and Job. To have understanding is to turn thyself from evil. To turn from evil. And this Lord will have compassion on you. So even though, so in other words, it's a form of showing your faithfulness as well as, to a degree, repentance, especially if for a time you knew it was there. <laughs> okay, actually going to get into that next. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 through 6 and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee the blessing and curse which I have set before thee and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee and shall return unto the Lord thy God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day thou and that thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul that, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possess, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart and with all thy soul, and when thou mayest live. So once again, it's compassion expended upon those. The Lord, this is for talking about from the Lord, not us as men, as fallen sinful men, but from the Lord. The Lord's compassion, the, the remember, the justice, the wrath, the anger for our iniquity or transgressions the abomination that we've committed before him as we repent of that and we turn away we turn away from evil and we do the good of which he's commanded which is has not changed then that goes to compassion in that what he has forgiven us of our sins and he extends to us the care of a father or later with Christ, the care of a good shepherd. And once again, what happens though when we are rebellious, when we are treacherous? Well then he will give us over to our enemies, give us over to the evils of which we perpetuate and they will consume us. that bearing in mind to think about that 
And that, to a great degree, applies to how we should be applying compassion as well, and we're going to see in due time. Let's turn our attention over to 2 Kings, chapter 13, verses 20 through 25. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in the year. It came to pass as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha. He received and stood up on his feet. But, but Haziel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of, of Jehoaz. The Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. And so Haziel king of Syria died, and Ben-Hadad his son reigned in his stead. And Joash the son of Jehoaz took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad the son of Haziel the cities, which he had taken out of the hand of Joash his father by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. But notice what's here is here. And the Lord was gracious upon, uh, unto them, the Israel, and had compassion on them, and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, neither cast he, he them from his presence as yet. So he has compassion. There's no direct blessing. There's no direct protection. He allows them to have to endure the war and the oppression to a degree, but to make sure that they, their lives are preserved. And why? Because he has compassion because of the covenant of the faithful that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, if anything, you know, his spiritual sons, those of his, those of his loyal sheep. So he has compassion on their descendants because of, if you read the book of Hebrews, their faithfulness, their relation with the Lord. But notice, because Israel at the time wasn't the one that repented, did not garner that compassion themselves because their hearts were still turned away from him, they did not receive the immediate protection, the immediate care directly from the Lord. They were only spared because of the sonship of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Lord did not want to violate his covenant, his promise that he made to them. The Lord is faithful even when you are no longer on this side of heaven. Second Chronicles chapter 30 verses 8 through 12. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so that they shall come again into this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you, if ye return, if ye return unto him. So the posts passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And in Judah the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. So you have these messengers, and they are warning, do not be like your forefathers, whom the Lord only spared you because he had compassion on the faithful before you, fulfilling the covenant, the promises he made to them. 
Don't be content, don't be complacent with being spared, with getting by. Because it's only a matter of time before what? Judgment. For the wrath, for the righteous verdict of God comes down upon you. And the Lord, what? Seeks what? Seeks what? Verse 12, also in Judah, the hand of God was given them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And that's another thing too, is unity. There is only unity amongst the brethren. There's a, quite, a, quite a bit of a, <laughs> other nonsense, if not just abominable doctrine of the devils when it comes to the nature of unity in and outside the church. That will be for another day. The look here is that the messengers continue to give this message in spite of the rebuke, in spite of the reproof, in spite of the hatred and scorn that they received. And nonetheless, afterwards, they convened together and who received, as you can imagine, who received the compassion from the Lord? Those who returned to him. Return to him. The Lord desires reconciliation. But his compassion is extended to those who likewise seek it. And that's the thing. How do we, how do we, before I move on, I'll emphasize it again. How do we, how do we extend compassion Godly compassion, biblical compassion, according to the word of the Lord, if we ourselves are content with mercy and grace, and by all means, thank the Lord every day for mercy and grace. But are we so ignorant, my dear brethren? Are we so cold-hearted towards his love because it's quote unquote unconditional that we would rather have the mercy and grace or the secondhand compassion because of those who came before, because of those who pray over us and are faithful. Instead, indeed, or should we be mindful of every day repenting and, and just welcoming the compassion, welcoming the personal care from the Lord from a son to his father, you know, sorry, from a father to the son, from the good shepherd to his sheep. And indeed, from us to those of which, well, you'll see. What of us? What of us? What of us who who are not the Father, who are not the one and only begotten Son. We shall see soon. Make sure you're also reading along in your in your you know in your scriptures, in your copy of the Word of Lord. I have one solid print. Like I said, I am ninety five percent King James, but really so many of a brethren use other translations, some I consider <laughs> Uh, some would consider laughable, if not, if not just jokes. And some I can, and some I consider uh, traps in themselves, limiting one's knowledge and growth in the word. But hey, I am, I am quite confident that for those of you pursuing the will of the Lord God and meditating upon His word, the Spirit will lead you. Spirit will lead you. Not necessarily to the King James Version. I'm not expecting that. But he will lead you. He will lead you. Let's see here. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 36, 14 through 17. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hollowed in Jerusalem. 
and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words, and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. So what's another form of compassion? And where indeed we play a role as those who are repentant, as those who have become the sheep, the good shepherd, the sons, the adopted children of the Lord God. And the Lord God is of, their, of their father sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, till the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Here's the thing. It, it, does the wrath come upon them because he misused the messengers? Partly. But mainly because they did not return to the Lord. Bear in mind. As his messengers as those willing to share a word. And that's the compassion, right? We don't want you to undergo the wrath of God. We don't want you to be judged guilty for eternity. We don't want you to be separated from the way, the truth, and the life. And neither does he and one of his acts of compassion is that you hear, that you hear truth, that you hear the word, that you hear what is contrary to your flesh, what is contrary to your self-righteousness, what is con contrary to your hypocrisy, what is contrary, and remember, this is applies, read the first verse, moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen. This is for religious and non-religious alike. As Christ says, there'll be many who say, Lord, Lord, but they don't know me. I don't know them. And why? Because they put on a show, do all the rituals, the regalia, whether it be Sunday, Saturday, Wednesday, Friday, the holidays, they use key words, they say my, if not say his name over and over again, but they very much transgress after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hollowed in Jerusalem, that can apply to a church that can apply, sadly. <laughs> I say sadly because, indeed, Roman Catholic Church, churches at large, the Mormon temples, Islamic mosques, Jewish synagogues, oh, such devout people they can be. Oh, such devout people that I know, some of which attend, attend, you know, attend my local con congregation, but the Lord knows all our hearts. There are those of which are against his word, who are anti-Christ, against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they may say, well, they're not. Remember, anti-Christ is an, oh, I hate Jesus. No, no, anti-Christ is, you don't believe who Jesus says he is. That's anti-Christ. And there's those who claim he says so himself. They know that he is the Christ, so to speak. And this is what the Bible says about him. And yet, it is just an abstraction. It's just an emotion. It is just knowledge at a very base level.
and this that's the thing until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy till there was no remedy go I didn't want a remedy <laughs> There's no, there is, that's the compassion is not an extension of an olive branch. And implanting it in those who are, in those who are rebellious, you know, rebellious. You extend the olive branch, and that's the thing, that's our part. We extend the olive branch. If they don't take it, well, the Lord has his way. And of course... For those of you who are listening and perhaps you are part of law enforcement or the military, well, remember what John the Baptist and Jesus reminded them of, is it's, when you're called to action, do you use the sword for your own personal gain, or is it to enforce the law, is it to protect the nation? And that's I say that because... There's been times within the last few years, and there may be times in the, in the future, perhaps in the near future, of which American law enforcement and the military may have to use force, if not deadly force, against American residents, if not citizenry. Because Lord knows there's a lot of people here who are not citizens. But even citizens, and perhaps, sadly, for more or less lawful and justified reasons. And I pray for you. And I pray for you. I do pray for you. I do not envy your position. And indeed, may you just give yourselves over to the Lord. And he will instruct you on how to carry out the work. He may have you not do it. He may have you there and execute it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he will tell you. He will tell you. And he will have compassion on you. He will have compassion on you for seeking his face, for pursuing his will, and not just of your own fear or your own whatever <laughs> whatever that whatever that may drive you that's apart from his will that when you submit to him and his righteousness because that's the thing the lord still uses men especially government including the government people including governments to exact his vengeance Nature for sure. <laughs> and it may sound controversial to you. It may sound dare you. Well, that's the thing. I've lived. I lived too long, and I. I, I expect if I live, do live another, thirty-two years, that I'm not going to see much difference in regards to man and our folly, to say the least. Combination of wrong and stupidity. <laughs> Sometimes we need. We need the state to crack our skulls to, to get us to just stop. Just, just, just stop. <laughs> and that's the thing, the Lord knows who's who amongst, amongst, the, uh, amongst the appointed, amongst those allowed to be in office, to be in power. His vengeance, his wrath will be upon them, but nonetheless, no less than us. He seeks them to return, to turn from evil, to turn from their sin, to turn from our rebellion. For that is his will for us, that we may not die but live. Let's go to Psalm 78, 35 through 41. Psalm 78. I confuse myself, I got my, mix, got my numbers mixed up. Psalm 78, 35 through 41. And they remembered, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues. 
for their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many times turned his, he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. So David's referring to Israel on its way from Egypt to Canaan to the Promised Land. So they, so it was saying, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues. How often do we remember, oh yeah, that's right, God is such and such and so and so and he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and blah, 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 blah. Once again, all these, all these extra biblical terms that we throw out and yet it doesn't mean anything to us. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Now listen carefully. Yea, many time turned he his anger away. Many time he turned his anger away. So sometimes he didn't. <laughs> but many time he did. And did not stir up all his wrath. So, he had compassion. But once again, the compassion was the care for them to what? Not be destroyed. Nevertheless, they still received judgment. They still received chastening. They still received dis harsh discipline, if not harsh discipline, but still warranted discipline. And remember, harsh is not a bad thing. Sometimes it's necessary, but I trust the Lord more to be harsh than us. <laughs> no less myself, my goodness. And 39, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. So he, so while we're being, and, and think about that, while we're being oblivious and foolish about our mortality, he remembers that we don't live forever here on this side of heaven. Which means that what? We can be separated eternally from him. So what? He gives, he spares us. He spares us. The compassion, a compassion of which is to be faithful to those who made a covenant with and to also the desire for us to what? Not be eternally separated from him. So he doesn't utterly destroy us all. Some people may be thinking right now, what about the flood? Well, if you didn't, here's the thing, read the chapter. Read the chapter, I believe it's Genesis chapter 7. Read it again. And it's pretty apparent that when a man is building a huge boat and tells you that God has seen everything you're, you've done and you know what you've done and all you have to do to not die is get on the boat or make your own boat for that matter in fact you know I could share with you I'm pretty sure Moses could have sorry not Moses Noah Noah could have shared instructions could have scaled it down perhaps but no. 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 As far as they were concerned, they were God, collectively. So there you go. So there you go. Look at that. And then think about that. What was the solution to the problem? Just build a big boat. Could have done it too. There, they. I mean, it took it took a long. When you when you read the read the story, it took a long time. <laughs> plenty of time, plenty of opportunity, especially with thinking about it. Moses' and his family. 
Imagine. So many more people could have done it themselves. The Lord gives and the Lord takes, but he is long-suffering. Long-suffering. I don't know about you, but uh, we don't have that kind of patience. We don't have that kind of mercy or grace. We don't have that kind of compassion. So indeed, we should be should be preparing our hearts. We should be return, you know, returning to Him, repenting of whatever it is, whatever it is, my dear listeners, whatever it is. When you compare your life, when you compare your actions, your words to the way of the Lord God, you can't help but realize, wow, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, extend your grace to me. And with that, you will receive his compassion. And that's to you. <laughs> Not because of somebody else who is faithful to the Lord, but to you. And that's where I say, my dear listen, that's where I say, my dear brother in Christ, that's where we want to be. In a place where we can receive the compassion of our Father, such an intimate, you know, intimate, sorrowful mercy for us, poor, you know, wretched, you know, sheep, poor, poor wretched creatures from our Good Shepherd, that in spite of ourselves, he is faithful and just to forgive. And thereby, we can do what? We can extend that compassion onto others where it is indeed warranted, and we will see that soon. we see that soon. Not showing compassion means you don't show love. Keep that in mind. But compassion is something indeed reserved for a certain degree of relationship that we're going to see soon. Go to Psalm chapter 86, verses 11 through 17. 86, 11 through 17. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Unite my heart. I have to stop here. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite. And what does it mean to you to walk in thy truth? Unite my heart to fear thy name. You ever feel like you have multiple personality disorder? There you go. That's what happens. That is what happens. Depression, anxiety, da 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 da, and everything, every other stupid label that we give there. Now, so then we can get the excuse to what? To take a substance, to know ourselves, to eat or drink something, to forget to watch and entertain ourselves just to quote quote relax and shut our brains off no 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 teach me thy way o lord ask him tell him receive it teach me thy way o lord guess what you can read it pray for it read it meditate on these words let his spirit teach you what these words mean to you, for you, to receive that compassion, to turn to his way. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Thy truth, which means what? To you, unite my heart. When you walk in his truth, he unites your heart to fear his name. You're not just a scatterbrained psychopath as sometimes still happens to me because what i'm not walking in his truth i'm doing my own thing listening to so and so and so and so letting this affect me and that oh and my wife said this to me so now i'm sad and upset and how dare she teach me thy way o lord i walk will walk in thy truth which means what he unites your heart to fear what? To fear what? We're all afraid of something. We're always afraid. Think about it. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm worried. I'm scared. Of what? And yeah, you can, you, you, you can give me a list of things. Or we can 
or we can remedy that. Unite my heart. Keep me all together in a singular state, a sober, strong mind and psyche and emotions, personhood, my soul is, res is restored. Remember Psalm 23, 3. He restores my soul. He leads me on path of, path of righteousness for his name's sake. And thus, our heart is united because we fear what? His name. The glory of who he is. And all the other stuff? Yeah, we gotta face it still. But his, his compassion, his care, isn't just for us to make us feel better, but watch, we'll read the rest of it. Verse 12, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth, and truth. You want the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Keep reading. And let it take you and guide you, comfort you. O oh, turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good that thy, they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, O Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. Yeah, it says, hope hast hope in me. That's more than helping. That's like, literally, hope, but that's, that's, you know, it's, it's like holding, it's holding you up, holding you in place, holding you to stand firm, stand your ground. And on top of that, if you want comfort. So you're not just standing there, standing there, towing the line, enduring, taking whatever is coming your way, but you're also being comforted. You are nurtured in affliction. And your heart is not scattered and just ripped and torn and, and torn and you know, pieces and pieces of ear and who you are here, there, and there, and you're and you're a me no. No, you're you know, you're together, and why? Because what holds you together? The truth in that of what? You fear the truth. And the truth is what? Who he is. Who he is. You're more afraid of offending, of violating, of betraying the Heavenly Father, the Creator of the world, the Redeemer of mankind, than anything else. I call that peace. I call that comfort. For this side of heaven? Oh yeah. And I've lived it, and I intend to live it more. I intend for that to be a ceasing thing. That's going to be the beauty of getting older. Is being stronger in heart. More resolute in mind. Be more pure in soul than in my younger years. And I'm going to need it, because there's no telling how much longer I'm going to live, and things are definitely going to change. But as the change comes, I will be more ready. I will be more ready. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. But until then, Lord, hope in me and comfort me. Hope in me and comfort me. Matthew, let's go to words of Christ. Let's go to the words of Christ. Some of you are like, what about Christ? You mean the word, the law? The one that indeed reflects all of which I've already shared with you, the embodiment, the word himself, same word that spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the kings? Yes. 
I've already read you what he has said. And now I'll read you what he is, has said while here as a man, which is not much different than what he said before. Matthew 9, 32 through 38. 32 through 38. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the, of, the, of the devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, plenteous, <laughs> but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So once again, is the thing. he sees what? That there are people without a shepherd. Remember, back in the time of the kings, the high priest, the chief of the priests and the people, the shepherds, the appointed shepherds, were faithless. And yet God still sends what? Messengers, faithful messengers, those who will actually carry out and share his word among them. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest, and be prepared to be one of those laborers, because after all, the disciples, shortly after, will be among those laborers. So pray for the laborers and be ready to fill your role as a laborer, because that, my dear brethren, is the compassion of the Lord as one of his sheep, as one of his sons. Is to be prepared, as we receive that compassion, we are ready, what? To be that laborer. To be that laborer. If you do not have a heart to be that laborer to be called upon in any given day of whatever he instructs you to do, whether it be short term or long term. I don't think you've received his compassion. And let me tell you, as I've read to you so far, that's not a good place to be. In fact, you may have to call your faith into question. And I'm not going to decide whether or not you're saved, but I'm just saying. Do a heart check with him, because, yeah, you may say, that's between me and the Lord. Well, yeah, sure. But once again, as I read to you, don't think you're going to fool him. Don't think you're going to fool him. You can do whatever you so will, whatever you so please. But it's not your will, but his, that is to be done. And he will hold you accountable for it. As he reminds me. <laughs> As he reminds me. Matthew 18. Matthew 18. The Lord sends his, his, sends his laborers, his messengers. Matthew 18, 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all he had, and payment to be made. Servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed the Lord of that servant. Sorry, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And for the sake of time, you read the rest of the story. That same servant who received compassion, whose debt was wiped, he went to another servant who owed him far less and began to abuse him and put him in prison. 
Verse 32, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts, if ye from your hearts, the Lord looks at the heart. You can you can do whatever you want on the outside. I can say whatever I want to say or do whatever I think is going to appease him on the outside. Whatever seems like it's good enough. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses, same will have the wrath, the judgment of the Lord. The Lord puts up with a lot of all of our whatever it may be and it's let me tell you something it's it's uh more than any of us can handle so that's the thing if you receive the compassion of christ that same compassion needs to be put out otherwise well that's high treason and it comes with fair amount of forbearance but it's uh it's painful it's painful one, go to, go, let's go to chapter 20, 30-34. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them, and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. They call him Lord. See him the son of David. They see him the son of David. And touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. When you read the rest of the T testimonies, you'll start to notice that when Christ has compassion on people, it's on those who are a, utterly helpless and not in a state of rebellion, not in a state of sin, or they call out to him recognizing who he is. That's when you see compassion. That's when you see a dis that's when you Again, yeah, it's not like he doesn't love anybody else. But that's where the compassion is received, right? Is indeed the willingness to be what a sheep, if not if not a son of the Lord God, or compassion for those who other sheep and sons of the Lord God, and because once again because of their faithfulness, he's compassionate towards you. <laughs> but once again, thank the Lord God for that. But that's not where we want to be individually. We'd rather be the ones. Being faithful, growing, and serving him, and receiving that care, that hope in, and comfort us. us. Mark chapter 5, 18 through 20. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. So this is a man who, this was a this is a demoniac. He was saved. He was he was delivered from this devil, and he wants to follow. But the Lord says, "No, no, go to every go to others and tell them for the compassion the Lord hath had on thee. Go tell them how the great things the Lord had done." It's again sends out messengers. And he, verse 20, and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. He received the compassion, and he became a laborer. Became a laborer. I think, if anything, that's where we're missing, is that we need to remember, we're always talking about how we're supposed to give compassion, but are we receiving the compassion because receiving the compassion is what gives us the spirit, the heart that's united in the fear of the Lord 
to give the compassion. Chapter 6, 32 through 35. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when the days was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This desert place, and now the time is far past. So you know what happens next. He has disciples. He provides the miracle. The disciples become the laborers. And he provides the miracle of feeding these thousands of people. But he has compassion. And why? Because they're coming out to him. Seeking what? A shepherd. Seeking guidance. Seeking comfort. They want the truth. They're looking for the truth. And thus the Lord has compassion on them. But notice, he gives them what first? The word. They're searching. They're leaving, not expecting to be fed. They're there, not expecting to be fed. As far as they're concerned, they're going to be hungry and go home and however it would work. They've traveled far. Many miles, people. On foot. And they want the truth. And the Lord sees that repentant, truly searching for the Lord, truly searching for the truth, the heart that is indeed in fear of the Lord, and, it re and he receives what their compassion, and it goes as far as to even provide for them physically. Why? Because that is what a father does unto, the heavenly father does unto his sons. Jesus Christ said himself, said, seek, knock, ask, and the Lord will give according to what you ask, according to his will, according to his word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, including the things that you need, will be added unto you. The compassion of the Lord first extends to what? Our hearts, uniting our hearts. Keeping us intact, our souls intact. And then giving us what we need overall inside of heaven for our bodies from the side of earth. But first and foremost, what? For our eternal selves. Indeed, we'll get a new, a new body in due time. But, but, but notice the, prerog the prerogative here. The heart that desires what? Truth. And when it receives the truth, when it receives the healing, when it's restored, it receives the compassion, it, it is obedient to be a what? A laborer of that same compassion. Let's finish up with Luke chapter 7, verse 17. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 7. Looks like I wrote this down wrong. Oops. Chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. My bad. <laughs> I did it again. You got the wrong thing. Thank you for listening, and I hope you're being edified. And pray for me that I receive the compassion of the Lord, and thus become an instrument, a laborer of His will, of His truth. Luke 15, 17 through 32. I say become, become more so than I ever am, more than I've ever done, you know, be, you know, before. May indeed, every day, a new heart, a new heart, one that is more like Christ. Luke 15, 17. This is about, yes. The prodigal son, and when he came to himself, he said, this is the son that took his inheritance and spent it all on whores, food, and cheap money. How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." He's returning 
to receive hope, to be grace and mercy, and understanding he needs to what? Obey, serve. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am in no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For, my, for this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. And as you recall, or you don't, his older brother was quite a quite ticked off by the fact that his that is uh, that is that is you know rebellious foolish brother had come back and received so much fanfare, so much blessing. He says, But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fattest calf. So he gave him the best. For a time, but notice what the father says. And remember, for those of us who, and I think some of us have done more to, to have to have wasted our earthly inheritance more than others. But regardless of where you're at, this is what you should expect from the father when he ex extends compassion to you. And the father says unto the older son, "Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine." It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was a lost and was found and is found. So keep in mind, the Lord in heaven there's gonna be a hierarchy. We're all gonna be I mean if you're in heaven, you're in heaven. <laughs> but on the, on this, to a great degree on this side of heaven and in heaven those who are more faithful are going to be entrusted with more but that's the thing though but the repentant those who have returned and received the compassion of Christ which is all of us by the way all of us We are going to be in the house of the Lord. We were once dead, once lost, but now we are found, we are alive. And the only thing we should expect is what? Not what the Father is going to give us, because we deserve nothing. But indeed, we are in his house. We are loved and cared for by him. We are hoped and comforted. And thus, all we are to desire as his only begotten son, Lord Savior Jesus Christ desired, was, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Compassion. Are you receiving it from the Lord? And thus, now you have the heart of which to give that compassion to others, and compassion is extended to those who are seeking the truth, who are open, who are open. Are you, are you ready to give what the people who are seeking after truth, seeking after the Lord, wanting to find the shepherd, wanting, wanting to be, wanting to, wanting to find, wanting to have a father, their heavenly father, to no longer be lost, to no longer be dead. Are you ready to give them what they need and be faithful in that? Just like just like the tale of good Samaritan, that parable in which Jesus Christ says towards the end, towards the end what? What does Jesus Christ say towards the end of the, t of the parable of a good Samaritan? If you read it very carefully, read the end of that parable, you'll notice there's giving of the compassion and there's receiving of the compassion this is Christian M.C. Fulmer 
Signing out.